dedicated to the strength of the nation, now heard on more than 1,000 radio stations. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Don DeFore in The Hills of Home, a United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is your producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where your motion picture favorites appear in plays we know you'll enjoy. That outstanding and popular performer of the cinema, Don DeFore, is our Proudly We Hail star. You'll hear Don as Douglas Clark in our play and travel with him to New York City and Saratoga as he pursues both a buyer for his Western real estate and romances a dream with a red parasol. In a moment, we'll have the curtain for Act One. Here now is a brief message from Wendell Niles. Young man, how would you like to look into the future? Okay, here's what I see. A good job where you can learn a valuable skill or trade. High pay to go with it. Education, travel, and adventure in foreign lands, and the pride of wearing a uniform respected at home and abroad. All these are yours with an enlistment in the U.S. Army. Find out if you can qualify at your recruiting station today. The curtain rises on Act One of The Hills of Home, starring Don DeFore as Douglas Clark. <laughs> We're in New York a few years before the turn of the century. Along a cobblestone street, a carriage approaches an old brick building. Inside the carriage is young Mr. Douglas Clark, a recent arrival from the West Coast, whose air of opulence didn't match his well-worn shoes and shiny trousers. You should have seen my pocketbook. I had a year before acquired some property on the West Coast. It was now my only tangible possession, and I had come east to try to sell it. Buyers were scarce. However, I got an excellent tip on a prospect who turned out to be the heavyweight boxing challenger, Battling Jackson, who was scheduled to fight John L. Sullivan. I was on my way to see Mr. Battling Jackson that day. Yep, this is it, sir. This is where the monster trains. Monster? Oh, very good, Cabby. Yeah, what do you want? Battling Jackson, please. He's right over there. Pardon me, my good man, but uh, would you be kind enough to take me to Battling Jackson? You're already there. You've arrived, boy. Oh, I, uh, I have? You're looking at one and the same. Well, uh, but, uh, how do you feel, Bat? With my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting all ready for your fight with John L. Sullivan? You know, uh, people say there's a possibility... I'll murder John L. What do you want? Well, Mr. Jackson, I'm uh, Douglas Clark, owner of some property in California. I thought you might be interested. Say, what are you doing? Trying to peddle me something? But they said you were looking for property. Sure, in Jersey, but not the end of the earth. Hey there, who let this peddler man? I get back. Well, take this anemic excuse for manhood and escort him to the door before I lose my temper and start breaking bones. <laughs> <laughs> I resent uh, that. No sense of humor, huh? Don't show him out, boys. Show him out. Come on. All right, 23, get out. Come on. Right, get out. Get out. Why? You can't do this. Oh. No. You can't do this. For me. Oh. <laughs> I was getting nowhere in New York, so I made a decision. I decided the Saratoga Springs might be the best place, after all, to obtain a buyer for my property. I marshaled my very meager resources and traveled to Saratoga. At breakfast the morning I arrived, my waiter was most cheerful. Well, good morning, sir. The world must be treating you right, waiter. <laughs> Reggie's the name, sir. Oh, yes, I've had an amazing streak of luck here recently. Well, I'm glad somebody's been lucky. At the races? Oh, no, sir. At seating. Seating? Well, what in the world is that? But it's a very fascinating game I play with Blodgett. He's the waiter right over there with the egg-shaped head. You see, it's like this. Oh, wait just a minute. Yeah. Oh, you kid. But, uh, what's wrong, sir? Look, it would just walk in on that red parasol. Oh, yes. Oh, my. She's lovely, isn't she? Mm -hmm. uh, look, waiter. Would you carry a note over there for me? Well, I would be happy to, but I shouldn't advise a note. No? Why? Her name is Costair. Catherine Costair. She's from New York. What of it? <laughs> Sir, you undoubtedly know what the name Costair means in the investment field. Oh, of course I should have known at once. Yes, I wouldn't suggest a note. It's too, uh, oh, uh, inanimate. But 
But now, in the afternoon, she usually walks that little spring down from the hotel. Excellent. Here you are, waiter. This is for all your very generous information. Oh, no. No, thank you, sir. No. It's a matter of principle with me, sir. You see, I couldn't help noticing your cuff is frayed. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, so it is. However, sir, uh, best of luck with the cost is. Uh, you'll need it. But then you might just possibly get by that first hurdle. The spring this afternoon? <laughs> the spring this afternoon. <laughs> Oh, Miss Carster. Yes? What is it? I see you don't remember me. No, I don't. I met you somewhere once. Yes? In a dream. Oh, please now. I really... Here, allow me to get you a cup of water. If you want to. There you are. The famous, wonderful, miraculous water of Saratoga Springs. (laughs) You like it, don't you? Uh, (coughs) I, I think it's quite... I'm lovely. Isn't it, though? I, I suppose I should be walking back to the hotel. May I escort you? Well, it's such a short way, and it's broad daylight. Oh, please, Miss Carstairs. You have no idea what terrible dragon may be lurking behind some unsuspected sunbeam. Uh, you are silly. My arm? You're so insistent. What can I say? That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> Here's the hotel. I'll be going in. Oh, wait a minute. Now that I've made a beginning, I refuse to have it end this quickly. Please have lunch with me. Oh, I can't. Oh, come on, please. You haven't eaten, have you? No, but I'm sorry. I just won't be able to. Well, uh, may I call on you? Oh, yes. I suppose so. Well, when? This evening? Well, I, I suppose it will be all right with my Aunt Gertrude. Well, I want it to be all right with you. What time? Uh, shall we say... Eight o'clock. All right. I'll begin living again at eight o'clock. Yes. Well, goodbye. Well, well, you don't even know my name. I'm Douglas Clark. Goodbye, Douglas Clark. Goodbye, Catherine Carstairs. Well, my boy, you passed the first hurdle in fine fashion. Arranging an engagement with Miss Coster already. Oh, yes. What's more, I'm going to marry the girl. <laughs> you are a brash young man, but I do admire your confidence. Well, by the way, Reggie, you don't seem quite as happy as you did this morning. Uh, this is a blasted game of seating I play with that egghead waiter there, Blodgett. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were going to tell me about that. Yes, well, it seems like this. Blodgett and I put up a wager at the beginning of each season to see which of us can attract the most outstanding clientele to his table. Oh, I get it. Yeah, that's the most exasperating in this business. Here the season is almost over. I think I have Blodgett, hands down. And Blodgett, the viper, he comes around inferring with considerable conviction that he has an ace up his sleeve. Oh, he's just bluffing. <laughs> you think so? Well, of course. If you want to stop him, just tell him you'll double the wager. Well, that's an excellent idea. Uh, I shall do that. Uh, yes. Oh, well, young man, I wish you luck when you face Aunt Gertrude. I can hear her saying, just what business are you in, young man? <laughs> business are you in, young man? Well, at the moment, I'm dabbling in real estate, one might say. I'm also trying to sell a hundred acres of land in California near Los Angeles. Yes. Well, uh, do you have other business, Mr. Clark? Oh, yes. One might say I'm constantly alert to all markets of business, and my many affairs do keep me very busy. Even though not necessary, I do like to keep a hand in things. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what of your other talents, Mr. Clark? Oh, if I may say so, Aunt Gertrude, Mr. Clark has a talent for expressing the most beautiful thoughts. Well, thank you, Miss Carstairs. <clears throat> well, I hardly meant that. I thought Mr. Clark might sing or play a musical instrument or something. Well, no, I, I should say if I have any talent other than my business, it is the recognition of grace, charm, and beauty. And I must say, when I first saw you and your niece dining on the terrace, I thought to myself... I have now witnessed the ultimate. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, you do say such nice Mr. things. Mr. Clark, shall we go out on the terrace? It's so lovely out. Well, uh, by all means. You'll excuse us, Aunt Gertrude. Reluctantly, my dear. Put a wrap around your shoulders. It's chilly out there. I shall, Aunt Gertrude. Oh, it is lovely out, isn't it? Yes. Do you think she liked me? Oh, of course. 
I was sorry to have you go through this. Oh, no, no, I didn't mind. I wanted you not to like me. Really, Catherine, I... May I call you Catherine? Oh, of course. Catherine, I... I want you to know how and what I feel about you. You see, one, one moment you're a beautiful flower, the next a rare and fragile section of imported lace. Lace? Did you say lace? Well, yes. But why did you say that? Well, no, because that's what you are to me. Please, I don't want to be that to you. Don't say that ever. Well, all right, but what Don't you... ask me why. Let's talk about you. Your property in Los Angeles. What's it like? Is it hilly? Mm-hmm. Nice rolling hills. Is that what you mean? Oh, I like that. Near the ocean, too. Very near the ocean. Catherine! Yes, Aunt Gertrude? Yes, you better be coming in now. Uh, yes, Aunt Gertrude. We must go in now. Would you have breakfast with me in the morning? All right. And then we'll walk to the spring. Yes. Until tomorrow, then. Until tomorrow. Aren't you going to order, sir? I've told you I'm waiting for Miss Carstairs. But I've told you she won't be here for And breakfast. I know she will. But, but, but please don't shout at me. Well, I'm sorry, Reggie. Well, I'm sorry, too. I suppose with me it's mostly the fact that the seating contest is practically over. Blodgett still smirks around like he has me for first. Well, why didn't you call his bluff like I told you? I did. I said double the wager. Not only took me up on it, he insisted we triple it. It's now $400. What? And besides that, you have to act so... Forgive me. So bullheaded about that. I'm not acting bullheaded. Then why don't you order? She isn't coming. Well, how do you know? I served breakfast to Miss Carstairs and her Aunt Gertrude an hour ago in their room. In their... Hmm? Yes. And Gertrude seemed very upset. I I don't think you made too good an impression on her. Oh, well, that can't be. That was most certainly my impression. Yes, I see a very dark storm cloud looming over the horizon for both of us. Well, I still prefer to be an optimist. Very good, sir. Be an optimist. You can still get your feet wet. And I dare say you will. <laughs> Clark Boothy from our story, The Hills of Home, starring Don Before, to bring you an important message from your government. Man, if you could be at Randolph Field, Texas, these days, you'd see plenty of activity. A new aviation cadet pilot training class has just started. One year from now, most of these men will have won their pilot's wings, and they'll be commissioned officers in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. Uncle Sam needs these pilots. He's going to need more. And that's where you come in, young man. You can qualify for the next cadet pilot training class which starts in October. Here are the requirements. You must be unmarried, 20 to 26 and one-half years old, and have completed two years of college. If you don't have the college requirement, you can still qualify by passing an equivalent test given you by the Air Force. And here's something to remember, men. Upon successful completion of your training, you'll earn up to $336 a month. Get your application right away at your nearest recruiting station or Air Force base. <laughs> The Curtain Rises in Act Two of The Hills of Home, starring Don DeFore as Douglas Clark. Well, the masterful Mr. Clark has lost his mastery of the situation. And the key to it all is the lovely young lady with the red parasol, Catherine Carstairs, and the dominating Aunt Gertrude. Yep, she was the key to everything, as far as I was concerned. And when she didn't meet me at breakfast, as she had promised, I tried to reach her in her room, but with no success. However, I was sure that she would meet me at the spring, our spring. As I walked down there that afternoon, I quite anxiously thought of the dire prediction Reggie the waiter had made. And I looked all over for Catherine. But the spring was deserted. With the exception of a fat little man wearing a very sour expression who spoke very fast. Water? No, no, thanks. You're looking for someone, aren't you? I can tell you're looking for someone. Oh, well, that's right. And she's a girl, isn't she? A lovely young girl. She puts stars in your eyes, doesn't she? Well, I... Oh, well, it's all right. I did the same thing 30 years ago, and I've regretted it ever since. I'll be delighted to hear all the boring details. Oh, it's all right. You're young. Nobody can tell you anything. Well, you're as old as me. Then you'll find out. Your wife will bring you here to Saratoga. How interesting. Sure she will, just like mine. Look, did you... Why, young man, do you know that there are 138 springs right here at Saratoga? And my wife has sampled them all, and I got to trot right after her. You really? Yeah, she spends the money and makes me trot. That's the way yours will be. Did the you name's say Beagle, yes, sir. Barney Beagle. Tell me, what's yours? Clark. Douglas Clark. Clark, Clark, Clark. Glad to know you, Clark. My business is courses. Biggest corset maker in New York. Tell me, what's yours? 
Well, at the moment, I'm selling property in California. Is that so? Where? Los Angeles. Well, I got a brother-in-law out there. Thinks it's a great country. Thinks in 50 years, there might be a quarter of a million people out there. I'm looking for... Yes, sir, here's my car. And listen, get me some information on that property of yours, and I might buy it. Oh, you mean... You... Really? You, you might be interested? No, I mean, really, I might be interested. But you better get that data to me quickly. You see, I'm leaving Saratoga tomorrow. I can wire my brother-in-law, and he can look the property over. Well, I certainly will get you the information, uh, Mr. Beagle. Ha <laughs> now don't you forget. I'll say, by the way, before I got here, did you see a girl with a red parasol? Red parasol? <laughs> can't teach him nothing. Just can't teach him nothing. Well, sir, the storm cloud I prophesied has broken. What do you mean? Did you serve lunch to Catherine? Oh, Catherine's all right. Is she, she is? Of course, and Aunt Gertrude, too. Gertrude thinks you're wonderful, talented, and wealthy. And then I added an endorsement of my own. Well, thank you. Their trouble is undoubtedly something in the family. Well, I feel very relieved. So what are you worried about? Simply this. Blodgett, the scoundrel, has loosed a veritable bombshell. He in our seating contest. What's that, Reggie? Battling Jackson. Battling Jackson? He's coming to Saratoga. Well, if he's coming to Saratoga, I'm leaving. Oh, it's disgusting. He's the only outstanding heavyweight contender. Worth 40 points in our seating contest. And Blodgett has him. How come? Man, I made a wager last year with a head waiter on Jackson to win. Jackson won. The head waiter remembers things an elephant would forget. Well, that's too bad, but I think it'll work out. Well, I think I'll run up and see how Catherine is, now that everything's okay. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute there. Oh, no, no, sir. You'd better listen to me. You're going to get me out of this pickle that I'm in. I am? You're going to arrange to dine with Battling Jackson at my table. Oh, now, Reggie, Bat Jackson would just love to knock my ear off, I assure you. We met once before, but I prefer not to lose my ear, particularly at your table. Please, please, sir, will you kindly arrange to dine at my table with Battling Jackson? I will not. Then I will be forced to let Catherine Carstairn and her Aunt Gertrude know that you are actually threadbare at the cuffs. Oh, oh. All right. But I'm sure it'll make no difference whatsoever to Catherine. Well, perhaps not. But it most certainly will to Aunt Gertrude. You can say that again. You know, this is coercion, don't you? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir. But you got me into this, advising me to double the wager with Blodgett, which he in turn tripled. Uh, this is an ultimatum? Ultimatum. All he has to do is eat at your table first. That is all. Sounds so easy. When does Bat arrive? Tomorrow. All right, Reggie, you win. I'll try to nail Bat for you. I <laughs> just hope he doesn't nail me. <laughs> Fine kettle of fish. I didn't even get a thrill out of giving Mr. Beagle the information on my property. I didn't even get to see Catherine. I had too much on my mind. How to make sure that Bat Jackson would dine first at Reggie's table? Well, it was one way to send you. A hunch from my previous meeting, and I took it. Well, sir, have you figured a way yet? He just arrived. Yes, Reggie, I have. I'm sending this note to Bat. Oh? Sort of an invitation to lunch. Here, let me read it to you. Yes, yes, yes. Battling Jackson, sir. Unfortunately, I find myself under the same contemptible roof with your own odious self. Kindly stay clear of me, particularly when I dine, because the sight of you makes me ill. Actually, Jackson, if you so much as set foot on the terrace when I'm dining, I shall be forced to personally eject you head first. Signed, Douglas Clark, Peddler. Sir, do you know what you're doing? I hope I do, Reggie. I hope I do. <laughs> Well, sir, the mail got through, and here he comes. And Blodgett is beaming in anticipation. Now, don't you fail me now. Oh, Bat looks very upset. Oh, my. What a gorilla of a man. Yeah. Gee, I, I wonder if Catherine will love me in pieces. He's coming to my table, all right. Oh, this is wonderful. This is terrible. Hello, Pedley. Uh, Bat, uh, we meet again. Yeah, I got your note. Uh, did somebody read it to you, or did you learn yourself? <laughs> you know... Anyone that writes a note like that to Bat Jackson or speaks like that to Bat Jackson, anybody who does that is either crazy or you got a great sense of humor. <laughs> you uh, thought it was funny, Bat? <laughs> funny? <laughs> well, I ain't never been insulted like that in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sit down, you jellyfish. You haven't even heard the beginning. <laughs> oh, what a car. Uh, waiter. <laughs> Bring this walking barrel of lard a menu, will you? Yes, sir. The walking barrel of lard. <laughs> oh, this fellow's a kick. 
Oh, here you are, Clark. Well, hello, Mr. Beagle. Uh, this is Mr. Bat Jackson. How do you do, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, glad to know you, Beagle. I'll be back in a minute, Clark. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Clark, I just checked out. I almost got away. Then I remembered I had business with you. Oh, yes, my property in Los Angeles. Yes, yes, that's right, Clark. Uh, uh, just a minute, Mr. Beagle. Catherine. Uh, Catherine, uh, Gertrude. Hello, Douglas. I'm so sorry. I've been confined. Well, Katie. Mr. Beagle. Wait, just a minute, uh... You know each other? Know each other? Why, sure. She works for me. Works for you? Oh, Mr. Beagle. <laughs> Laces courses. Best course at Lacer I got. Do yeah, sure. Won a prize. Extra vacation money. Didn't dream you'd come to Saratoga, though, Katie. Oh, Mr. Beagle, how could you? How could I what? They told us you checked out. Us? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, hello, Gertie. Well, you know her, too? Sure, that's Katie's cousin. Sometimes works in the stage department. Actress, if she's not so hot. Oh, dear. Everything is ruined. It certainly is. And let me tell you, Mr. Beagle, I may have been the best lacer you ever had, but I'll never lace another corset for you as long as I live. Come, Katie. Oh, oh, uh... <laughs> now, what in the dickens have I done? You see, boy, women for you. Give them a nice, clean job, lacing corsets. Nicest job in the world, and then they want something better. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Beagle. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, don't, don't run away. Oh, oh, listen, I wanted to tell you, Clark. I had my brother-in-law check into that property. Catherine, come back. Clark, Clark, don't run away till I tell you. Your property's no good. Water's contaminated. Comes up all black. Uh, sorry, Mr. Beagle. Yes. Now then, look, when you talk to Katie, you just tell her to be sure to get back to work at 8 o'clock Monday morning. Don't care how she talks to me. Best course at lacer in the business. Look, I'm sorry, Mr. Beagle, but Katie uh, and I, well, Catherine, that is, uh, we're going to be married. Well... Well, now, if that doesn't beat all, women have to get married, don't they? Can't work in a nice corset factory. Oh, Clark, old boy, your trotting days are just starting. It was all Gertie's fault. All right, all right. It was. When I won the vacation prize at Beagle's, Gertie said it was my big chance. Well, you, you certainly were convincing, particularly Gertie. She's an actress, supernumerary at the opera. Also, sometimes works extra putting stays in at Beagle. Yes, uh, so I heard. I wanted to tell you. Really, I did. Well, all right, all right. If it'll make you feel better, I, I was doing a little masquerading myself. You were? Yeah, that's right. You're, you're not getting any big bargain. Yes, I am. Oh, now, come on. Stop your sniffling and listen to me. All you're getting is a guy who owns a parcel of land on a place called Signal Hill in California. I can't even give it away. I don't care. I'm not particular. Well, all right, all right. Now, come on. Settle down. Feel better? Better. Hmm. Say, you know what? What? I just realized something. You've never kissed me. Well? Well, one sure thing. What? There wasn't any make-believe in that. Well, when a young man can't give away a hundred acres in one of the big oil-producing areas of the earth, I suppose it isn't make-believe either. Or is it? <laughs> Curtain falls in the final act of The Hills of Home. Our star, Don DeFore, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. Here is a postgraduate question for you high school graduates. What is the largest adult education program in the world? Any regular Army soldier can tell you. The answer is the United States Armed Forces Institute. Yes, the Armed Forces Institute has had more than two million servicemen and women enrolled. What does this have to do with you? When you enlist in the Army, you'll be able to continue your education. Wherever our soldiers are stationed, at home, in Europe, or in Japan, they can take courses from the Institute. You'll be able to study subjects at all levels, such things as accounting, journalism, and many others. Yes, you'll find plenty of opportunities for education in your Army career. Get all of the facts right away at your nearest U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. And now, once again, our star, Don DeFore, and our producer. For a brilliant performance, come back, Don, and take a well-deserved bow. Thank you, C.P. The pleasure is all mine. Don, on one of your previous shows, we told our audience all about your commuting between Hollywood and Broadway, 
pictures in the theater of summer stock and your days at the Pasadena Playhouse. You know, I'd like our friends to meet you here as an ingrained but transplanted Iowan. Well, you know, C.P., I don't believe any of us ever break away from our hometown influence. That's why my wife, Marion, her mother and I, are in love with our Midwest farm-type house. Where you are known as the Iowa Rail Splitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really didn't split the rails, but I did build a three-rail fence around the place. Marianne made all the curtains and drapes, and her mother designed and made the shades for all the lamps I made. Hal Wallace, your producer, tells me that you've turned down 15 summer stock plays to work on your new house. That's right. That's what a new house does to you, C.P. Oh, well, I know it. And by the way, how's your writing coming along? Well, uh, you know, I, I have a studio hideaway in the half story of the house. You reach it only by ladder. Yes, you climb in, pull up the ladder, and the stories flow out of the typewriter. <laughs> well, not that fast, C.P., but I am writing a musical and also an outside story for an outside picture I hope to get, which is a, is a comedy drama. And I have a few ideas for short stories I'm playing around with. And in your spare time? I'm just living, C.P. Oh, good. <laughs> I've got a breather now that Romance on the High Seas has finished at Warner Brothers. I'll be looking for it. And incidentally, we have a great play for next week. Well, let's hear about it, C.P. Next week, Don, and ladies and gentlemen, we present Vagabond Dream, starring Martha Scott as Ruth, a somewhat cynical miss who holds to the happiness of a single dream. Bitter experience in an unfriendly world has taught her that with each dream there comes a rude awakening. But she does awaken once to happiness in Vagabond Dream. I'll be in the hideaway at curtain time. Goodbye, goodbye C.P., and it was a pleasure. Goodbye, Don. <laughs> Join us next week, won't you, ladies and gentlemen, when we present Martha Scott in Vagabond Dream. Until next week... This is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening and cheerio from Hollywood. Don before appeared through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars in this program. The story was by Rich Hall, with the orchestra under the direction of Eddie Scrivani. This program is rebroadcast to the armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the armed forces radio service. Remember, proudly we hail next time presents Martha Scott. This program was transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking. <laughs>